Dear friends, dear colleagues, welcome to 11th uh, part of the ECOMOS uh, International Committee of Underwater Cultural Heritage uh, webinars. Uh, to have the opening uh, speech, I would like to invite Dr. Christopher Underwood, who is the president of ECOMOS ICUCH. Uh, thank you, Hakan, and thank you, thanks again for organizing number 11 of our series of webinars that seems to be extending perhaps into even 2022. They, they've proven popular and extremely diverse. Today is a very special occasion for me to welcome my wife, Dr. Dolores Elkin, more often known to her friends and colleagues as Lolly. She's an Argentinian archaeologist with a tenured research position at the country's National Council for Scientific and Technical Research, better known as CONICET. She is based at the National Institute of Anthropology, which is part of the Ministry of Culture, where she is the director of the Underwater Archaeology Programme since its creation in 1995. She is also the current vice president, past president of the 2001 UNESCO Convention Scientific and Technical Advisory Body, also known as STAB. She is a professor at the University of Buenos Aires, contributing to the development uh, speciality both at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. But she has also conducted many outreach initiatives within the sport diving community and the general public and is currently a board member of the National Monuments Commission. She has been the principal investigator of many research and management projects, most of them involving shipwrecks from the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries, located in Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego, which are in the south of the country. Perhaps most well known is her research of the English sloop of war, HMS Swift, which sank in 1770, an English warship. She has more than 100 publications, including books, peer-reviewed scientific papers, and book chapters and publications for the general public. She has organized and participated in many national and international scientific meetings, and is affiliated with several organizations, including Ikemosa Kuch. She holds a professional scientific diving license from the country's National Coast Guard Agency, and she has also received a number of national and international awards in recognition of her work. And may I add, she is a pioneer in underwater cultural heritage in Argentina. Lolly, over to you. We're all looking forward to hearing your, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And um, hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. Nice to see so many friendly faces and, and appreciate uh, for all of you being here with me today. And I'm going to share my screen and just get on with the presentation. I assume you can, you can see it. We need that better. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, well, as the title of my presentation states, uh, I'm going to talk about our work at the National Institute of Anthropology with our team, the Underwater Archaeology Program, or PROAS. And I will try to provide an overview of many activities that we conduct with a focus on uh, research and management. And maybe, Chris, I ask you to mute yourself so I we don't uh, have uh, interference pro problems. Thank you. And I, I want to start with, with this photograph of our dear, very dear Mexican colleague and friend, Pilar Luna Reguerena, because she played a key role in the development of underwater archaeology in Argentina, my country. I was already thinking of starting uh, with a program on underwater archaeology, but I, I didn't have any experience in diving, in historical archaeology, in shipwrecks. I was working on land high altitude desert archaeology by then. And I met this wonderful woman and I thought, well, if she could do what she did in Mexico, maybe, maybe I can do something similar in my country. So this is a tribute to her. As you know, she left us last year. Okay, our program. It was created in 1995, so we're just uh, on our 25th year 
anniversary. And like many programs, probably in your respective countries uh, as well, we started by combining archaeology and diving. To my knowledge, at that time, there were no archaeologists who dived in Argentina. And so I, I started putting together a team with people like myself who, who were beginning to learn to dive, but we, who already had a degree in archaeology, but also students of archaeology who maybe had some experience in diving. And of course, people from other disciplines or specialities like uh, marine biology, professional diving, uh, conservation, history, etc. But we wanted um, archaeology to be the center of, of the program. We soon realized that it was important to conduct different, uh, let's say, lines of activities simultaneously, which are the ones you can see on the screen. Legislation was crucial back then because we didn't have any law that protected UCH in our country. Archaeological research was essential because uh, in the team there were people like, like myself, and I happened to be uh, responsible for the entire team, uh, who had to work in research more than anything. Uh, like Chris said, I, I am employed by the National Research Council, and I, and I, have, um, I have to devote 100% of my time to research. So the other activities, I do them because I think they're important, but I'm not paid for that. Um, I also wanted archaeology to, to, to get a leading role uh, in, the, in the program, aside from my own uh, personal situation. Management, of course, was very important as well. Uh, dissemination to let people know what all this was about, because UCH back in 90, 1995 was uh, only associated to uh, treasure from shipwrecks. And of course, capacity building, not just for ourselves, but like I said, some of us had to learn to dive at the beginning, for example, and learn about UCH, but also uh, we hope that with time we would be able to train or help in the capacity building for others who would follow us. So starting with legislation, which like I said, was essential at that time, uh, a landmark took place in year 2003, when national law 25743 was passed. After many years of us uh, interacting with politicians, uh, legislators, heritage managers, etc., finally, this law in this article says that it includes within the concept of archaeological heritage, elements that are submerged in jurisdictional waters, as you can read in the underlined, underlined bit, and also, um, also not just from pre-Columbian times, but until historic recent times. This was pretty new also because the previous law we had for archaeological heritage, A, was only applied to land archaeology, and B, was restricted to prehistoric or pre-Hispanic archaeology. So these two components of the new law were fantastic. And by the way, recent historic times in this law means um, until 100 years ago. You will soon note the, the alignment with the UNESCO Convention, which also has a threshold for 100 years to consider, uh, in the case of UNESCO Convention, UCH. And talking of that, at an international level, we had uh, a considerable involvement in the development and promotion of the UNESCO 2001 Convention. My first participation was in 1999, when we, together with my boss, the director of the National Institute of Anthropology, we attended a meeting in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic in one of the stages of the drafting of the UNESCO Convention. And then, of course, I was able to interact with many uh, other people who are involved in the promotion of the convention, including Pilar Luna, for sure, and uh, Tony Carell and Peggy. Um, I've seen Peggy here in the audience. Uh, Peggy and, and Tony are, of course, members of ICUCH, like was Pilar, and the four of us were known as Chicas Radicales, or Radical Girls, because we, we really fought for the convention and we continue to do so. 
Uh, as you also know, I'm a member of the scientific and technical advisory body to the convention. So that's that's uh, that takes us takes up uh, part of my activities. Okay, uh, moving on to research and more because I'm going to mention some things that are related to the to our research projects. Like I said, these are very important components of our program. And in the map, you can see the, the locations in which we have been conducting uh, projects throughout these 25 years. Our headquarters are located in Buenos Aires City. But as you can see, we've been mostly working along the coast of the South Atlantic Ocean. And today I'm going to mention two projects which I wanted to highlight because they were they are projects in which I, I have been involved um, considerably as a, as a principal investigator. One is the HMS SWIFT project in Puerto Deseado, which Chris uh, already mentioned briefly in his introduction. And the other one has to do with a Spanish uh, 18th century frigate merchant vessel in the Atlantic coast of Tierra del Fuego. So regarding the first one, uh, as it was said already, HMS Swift was lost in 1770, and it was a British sloop of war, uh, which was part of the British fleet in uh, Malvinas Islands, better known as Falkland Islands in the English-speaking community. And it sank in the place that you can see here in this map. This is the town of Puerto Deseado. We are looking towards the Atlantic Ocean, which is over here, so we're looking east, and the site is more or less over here. In the images on the right, you can see our, our pontoon or working platform in one of the, uh, or, or more of the, of the field seasons. You can see it is pretty much in the, in the harbor of Puerto Deseado. And it is a, um, it's a very interesting site, which we excavated basically between 2002, 2010. By the way, we didn't discover the site. The site had been discovered by local divers back in the early 1980s. And, um, but the province of Santa Cruz wanted our team, as soon as it was formed, to take up the archaeological research in the site. So this image shows the the site plan, of course, and in red, the areas in which we conducted excavation, uh, archaeological excavations. The site has quite uh, poor visibility. It's about a meter, a meter and a half. And the water is, of course, uh, quite cold in the South Atlantic, so we, we have to wear uh, dry suits for our work. And it is a very rich but very complex uh, archaeological context. Here is just one example of one square meter of one of the archaeological levels of the site, uh, in which you can see the, the artifacts that are um, contained within other artifacts, for example, and of course a lot of materials that are part of the, of the ship structure. Uh, by the way, we estimate that about 65-70% of the hull is preserved, of course, wooden hull. And here's an example of some furniture uh, pieces that were found in the stern, in the area occupied by the officers. You can see in this image the excavation of one of the shelves that belonged to this, um, this uh, furniture piece, like a, like a cupboard that in, had some shelves with special holes to contain and keep in place um, elements such as um, ceramic or porcelain, porcelain bowls. Um, we also were able to study topics such as the hier hierarchies amongst the, uh, the crew, being able to tell that the officers used elements of, of high quality as expected, such as Chinese porcelain, but also uh, good quality English earthenware. They also used uh, good quality metal objects. 
Um, the excellent preservation of the site allowed us to study topics that have to do with organic remains, such as what did people eat on board? And we found the elements that you can see here on the screen that includes condiments and, and fruit and things like, uh, like penguin eggs, which of course are elements that would never be mentioned in the historical documents amongst the Admiralty uh, uh, documents or regarding the rations, because these are things that were collected locally. In Patagonia, uh, it's, uh, and of course in Antarctica, but also in, in continental Patagonia and in the archipelago, archipelagos, it's possible to collect penguin eggs uh, in, in some seasons. And of course, this uh, provides um, an additional, um, well, it enriches the, the diet for sure. So we, we were particularly eager on the, on the penguin eggs. This is um, an egg of a uh, king penguin. We also addressed some technological issues. For example, is the, are the artifacts representative of the technology of the time? Are they standard? Are they special? And for example, in the case of glass or the glass artifacts, we could tell that they are quite, um, let's say quite characteristic of the 18th century and they have a considerable variety in, in quality. Regarding metal, there was, this was an interesting find, which is that some of the composition, the chemical composition of coins, which were supposed to be pure copper, were instead made of an alloy, reducing the amount of copper. And not only that, but uh, some of them were also uh, made with molds instead of being struck as they were supposed to be. So they were counterfeit. And uh, also we were able to, to note some evidence of repairs like welding in some objects like the candle holder you can see on the right. Uh, at some point, a very interesting chest, a small chest was found full of vials and other containers like the ones you see in this uh, image which allowed to address the topic of health. We, we are pretty sure these belong to the surgeon on board and some chemical analysis to the contents allowed to identify the use of uh, mercury in the form of mercurious chloride or in, in pure form. And as you probably know, mercury at the time was used to treat uh, venereal diseases, but of course it not only did, did not cure venereal diseases, but it could cause severe uh, neurological damage to to the person. So clearly uh, at the time of the SWIFT, they were still using mercury. Uh, we also found, or uh, it was possible to identify this substance called anthracinone, which is used for treating things like gum or skin um, diseases or injuries, um, for example, burns. So this is an interesting, very interesting strand of, of research in my opinion. And the fact that the vials were found in many cases with stoppers is allowing this chemical analysis of the content. We've also addressed the topic of site formation uh, processes at the site. The person in the image is Dr. Ricardo Bastida, marine biologist who participated in the project pretty much throughout, uh, throughout the whole stages of research. And he led the, um, the research strand on, on site formation processes, at, at least in terms of uh, biology. And as you can see, we found elements, wooden elements, severely attacked by uh, marine wood borers which was a bit of a surprise because the general idea is that in cold waters they are not so active, but um, clearly this was the case. And, and we think this happened after the, sink, after the ship sank because uh, the attack was found in, I don't know the word in English for the, the, the upper part of the ship structure that uh, was not underwater, for example, when the ship was in the Caribbean or in, or in warmer waters. 
Uh, there was a very unexpected find in the SWIFT, which was a human skeleton that um, was not only unexpected but interesting because it allowed to, to do many things from the research point of view, to, to conduct some bioanthropological studies, also in association with the accessories and pieces of garment that were uh, associated to the skeleton, such as the buttons, buckles, or shoes that you can see on the, on the right of the image. Mm. And what we know so far about this skeleton is that it belonged to a male person, a young adult, about 25 years old, meter 67 in height, probably right-handed, with good bone and dental health, and we, this is interesting, when he died, he was wearing a red woolen jacket. This was able to be known because there were traces of, of red wool attached to some of the bones, uh, like the scapula. And that implied that the person was wearing a military uniform at the time of death. In turn, that implied he was a Marine. He was... Uh, because it had a, a, a red jacket. So we know that he has to be one of two persons who were the two Marines who died in the accident, Robert Ruskert or John Ballard. By the way, the whole crew were 91 people and three persons died, including two Marines. So we know it's one of the, he's one of, of these two. However, when DNA was extracted from the skeleton, uh, it was, as it's usually the case with ancient DNA, it was mitochondrial DNA. As you probably know, this implies that it's very difficult to identify the individual because mitochondrial DNA is transmitted through the line of the females along the genealogy. So uh, if you want to go back all the generations uh, to 1770, you would have to identify women who were related to this person. And also the, the surnames of, we, of women tend to be lost with the marriages. So it's difficult to find, if you start looking for the last name Rusker or the last name Ballard. Uh, so I'm not saying it's impossible to identify the person, but it's challenging. It's something, it's a, one of the things that is pending that we would like to, to do at some point, to, to attempt to identify the person. In the meantime, uh, this young man is buried in the city of Buenos Aires in the so-called British Cemetery. It's actually a sector, a British sector within one of the main cemeteries in the city. And this was a very special ceremony because it was conducted by a um, with the presence of representatives from the Argentinian Navy and the British Navy. And the ceremony was in English and Spanish. So it was, it was pretty moving, pretty rewarding too. A word on conservation. This of course is a challenge for the HMS Swift and, and for every example of UCH, but given the amount of organic remains that are found in this site, it is, I would say, particularly uh, demanding. Uh, nonetheless, the, the local museum in Puerto Deseado, which is a Museo Brososki, is in charge of the, of the conservation of all the collection, conservation, curation, and exhibition of all the collection. And uh, these are just some e examples of some organic materials. Talking of the Brososki Museum, it has been completely uh, refurbished right before the pandemic, uh, December 19th. Uh, 2019, and it has a, a new exhibition, and and well, now that the the lockdown is um, finishing or slowly opening up, it's doing quite well. And I checked in Wikipedia yesterday, and I found uh, I found this, which is it's nice uh, being somebody who has participated in all the archaeological research, which is the it says that the it's on the only museum of underwater archaeology and conservation in Argentina, and it's dedicated mainly to the to the Swift uh, Sloop. So it's really nice to have a, a museum of, of this sort in our country. 
Um, we, of course, we've published quite a lot on the SWIFT. These are some examples. The main publication is the image in the center. It's a book called The Shipwreck of HMS SWIFT, 1770 Maritime Archaeology in Patagonia. It is in Spanish, but we hope to have an edition in English in the near future. And uh, we also published in places like the uh, IJNA, and uh, hopefully next year there will be an article for post-medieval archaeology as well. And we also have publications more for the general public, like uh, brochures or things like the one shown here on the left, which is called In Patagonia. There have also been videos, a film, a TV program on the SWIFT and even a novel inspired on the wreck. The novel called The Sunken Secret is a, it's a thriller, it's a, it's a murder uh, novel and it's, it's doing quite well. So it's nice to see all these uh, outcomes of, of the SWIFT. And here's a picture of, of the core team of, um, of the project, which is now in a sort of standby partly because the museum's facilities cannot um, take up more artifacts. So we, we, we think it would be irresponsible to continue the excavation or extracting more artifacts if there's no capacity in the museum to, to deal with them. But uh, there are about 700 artifacts already in the collection, which is, which is plenty. So the uh, second project I wanted to talk about today, like I said, is um, is located in Tierra del Fuego. We're moving south on the uh, Atlantic coast of, of the main island. This is a close-up of the, of the research area. It's a peninsula called Peninsula Mitre, which was part of the Cape Horn route. The ships uh, came through uh, or along this Strait of Le Mer and then turned west into the Pacific or south, southwest, uh, this is uh, Staten Island. So this is a peninsula Mitre where there are quite a lot of, of wrecks, uh, at least documented historically. Some we, we found traces of physically and are part of uh, our archeological research. But one in which we wanted to focus particularly is this one, the Purisima Concepcion. I told you it was a Spanish uh, merchant vessel, a frigate, which uh, was lost in, in Peninsula Mitre in 1765. It stranded on, on the coast. And there's a diary, which is the, uh, the image you see on the left, that's a cover, which is at the National uh, Naval Museum in Madrid which uh, describes in detail the story of, of the crew. There were about 300 people, all of them survived and were able to, to build a new ship and come back to Buenos Aires after three months. And during those three months in which they stayed in Tierra del Fuego, they, they interacted with the Aboriginal people, with the local native communities, which by the way, inhabited uh, the island until I would say late 19th century, pretty much. Uh, it was the last frontier. And, uh, and the diary includes uh, fantastic ethnographic descriptions of these people. And, uh, and also they interacted with them in, um, uh, with harmony. So that was also quite, quite exceptional and um, really, really interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a highlight of this story, which is quite emblematic for the province of Tierra del Fuego. So we wanted to see if we could find some archeological evidence for this site. And there was some background, which was this cannon found by locals in 1981, which despite being quite uh, er eroded, so not much could be said about it, but it was found in a part of the coast which seemed to coincide with the geographical descriptions provided by, by the shipwreck survivors in, in that diary I mentioned earlier. So we tried to, to figure out which area this was and conducted, like I said, some research looking for uh, archeological evidence. So there we went. It's, it's quite a journey to get to this part of the island. We normally go on horseback. It is three days 
uh, the journey takes three days to get to, to the place from the place where the road ends. So um, the field work is is a bit challenging to say the least, but it, but it's uh, it's a fantastic, a spectacular part of the world, and it includes crossing rivers and things like that. So quite an expedition. I take the opportunity that I have more time to, today than normally in an archaeological presentation in a conference. So I show you these images, which I hope you like. So the goals of our project, like I said, was to, uh, to find some archaeological evidence. And we, we chose two areas, which are the ones indicated with, uh, with arrows. One was the area where we thought that could be the shipwreck site because we thought that that canal could be could have been found here. And by the way, the canon has um, a caliber that matches the, the canons that the ship carried on board. And this other area inside, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, um, I, there's a microphone that is on. It can be muted. That would be appreciated. Uh, I was saying the second area is here inside this cove, which is called Caleta Falsa, where we thought the campsite could have been established. The distance between these two places is about three kilometers, more or less. So we worked on land and on, underwater. Uh, on land, we work on that plain inside the cove that I just showed you where the possible campsite could be. Uh, by by doing some test pits and we found some ceramic, which is the one shown in this image in the center, which had all the aspect of being um, part of a, uh, an olive jar, like typically Spanish, of coarse um, pottery. But we also found some refined earthenware that was uh, English, uh, style at least, like the images on the right. Uh, by the way, this is a very small item. It's a, it's like the knob of, um, I don't know what's the word in English, for the place where you keep the butter, like a butter um, plate with a lid. So this was part of the lid. But at least it, it was typically 18th century. Uh, so given that the Purisima Concepcion was a merchant vessel, it could have carried on board uh, English ceramics as well. We also worked in the adjacent forest from the plain that I just mentioned, and the forest was the place occupied by the, by the native people. And there were fascinating finds there, which are the ones shown here. An arrowhead made in glass. So with traditional techniques, like let's say for flint napping, but made in glass and also glass beads. So clearly this shows a contact, a direct or indirect, but contact with European uh, materials. So little by little, the, the jigsaw of the Purisima Concepcion seemed to acquire uh, more and more pieces. In the intertidal zone, uh, remember I said it was where, the, where we thought the cannon was found back in the 80s. We found some cannon shot and some other materials like heavily eroded uh, ceramic shirts. These look English and some that look again like Spanish, more coarse and with green uh, enamel and some interesting uh, elements such as um, gems, maybe we can call them, but made of glass that perhaps were taken by the, by the Spanish people to, to trade with, with the native peoples or perhaps to decorate uh, garments. We don't know really. The, the ship was going from Cadiz in Spain to Lima in Peru. We also conducted some underwater search uh, right next to, to that uh, intertidal song when, where the artifacts I just showed you were found. For this, we got the help of uh, Michael Criver, who is in the image, and also uh, Joe Hoyt. So our, our two colleagues from the US who 
came and helped us. This was uh, in 2017. And here you can see the relationship between places. This is Caleta Falsa, the cove. This is where the campsite would have been, more or less. And this would be the intertidal zone where the cannonballs and other things were found. And this blue rectangle is the area where we planned to do some um, uh, magnetometry searches. For that, we did get a vessel. So uh, we definitely needed some watercraft. So part of the expedition went on horseback and part with, um, with this vessel you can see in the image, which also took the diving gear. The results were successful in terms of the magnetometry because some clear um, magnetic anomal anomalies were identified and we believe they correspond to the rest of the canons. If one or two or even more uh, were on land, to our knowledge is only the one I showed you, the ship, according to the historical documents, carried 20 iron cannons. So there should still be enough at the site. And obviously the cannons were not useful for the shipwreck survivors. The wood and the fittings were much more useful to construct the new, the new ship and, and leave the area. So we're pretty sure, like I said, that these anomalies correspond to the cannons, but regrettably, the diving did not allow to, to check them. So we need to do another field work as soon as we can to, uh, to check that. Okay, uh, just to finish with a few slides, um, I'm going to mention a couple of examples of management activities aside from the projects I mentioned. One has to do with the constant development of a database of shipwreck sites. But I want to make clear, we're talking about potential shipwreck sites for now. This is the image of the Rio de la Plata, the river that divides Argentina from Uruguay. Uh, this is about 50 kilometers. There are a lot of wrecks that are documented for the area, um, but we know that for only a few that there is actual archaeological evidence, but that's something that we do gradually and not just for this area, but for Patagonia as well. Of course, we try to, to do uh, activities that disseminate uh, as part of management in a way, the, the concept of UCH. We uh, work with the police, both at a national and international level, like with Interpol, uh, against illicit traffic. Uh, regarding capacity building, I want to start with the course we teach at the University of Buenos Aires, which is something that is an undergraduate uh, seminar on UCH that we were teaching since 2012. And it's on research and management of underwater and coastal archaeological heritage. This year, we were able to do it online, like most of us had to had to do when teaching. And the positive thing, as we know, is that perhaps more people can attend. In this case, this year we had 23, at least 23 participants, including some from other countries, not just Argentina. So that was good. And through the University of Buenos Aires, there also, there's also a production of dissertations, both licenciatura, which is like a, like a master's, similar to a master's degree, um, or between a, a BA and a master's degree, it's five years studies and a thesis and a PhD dissertations. So, so far we have a, combining the ones that are completed and the ones that are ongoing on, two, on those two levels, we have a total of 15 theses on a UCH. So we're really happy for that. We also participate in capacity building um, in the area of professional development, specifically the UNESCO courses that you're all familiar with. Argentina has participated in three, one in Campeche in Mexico in 2010, one in Argentina in 2013, and one that is taking place right now, uh, which is online, and um, which has 86 students. You can see the, uh, the, the chart is uh, like a pie chart with 
with all the countries. This is for Latin America and the Caribbean. But out of those 86 students, um, 68 are from Latin America, that is um, Spanish or Portuguese speaking countries. So you can see, you can see the interest, you can see the activity. The field is, is growing. It's, co it's coordinated by Carlos del Cairo from Colombia, by the way. And you can see that Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, Bolivia, to a lesser extent, Ecuador are the countries with the largest number of participants. And we also uh, work on capacity building in terms of the NAS courses. We think it's really important. We've been doing it for almost 20 years now. And we run courses in Buenos Aires and other places. At the moment, they are um, run by uh, Dr. Guillermo Gutierrez, who is part of our team. He lives in Patagonia, in Puerto Madryn. And um, we're working uh, closely with the Diving Operators Association in Puerto Madryn. And, and I want to highlight this, with the National Park Service of Argentina. They are taking uh, the NAS courses with us and they're involved in other activities. The images you see here are uh, precisely from one of those NAS courses done in a new marine protected area. And it's fantastic to see that the park rangers are learning to dive, learning about UCH, and, and being active uh, with regard to UCH and, and helping us for sure. So we're really, really happy with that. Of course, integrating with the natural heritage, nobody discusses that, but um, it's something that is growing. So to finish, uh, I wanted to, to share with you what, uh, what our team uh, is at present and what it uh, looks to be in the future. As, as you know, in all teams, there people come and go and, and they are dynamic uh, groups of people. But pretty much the persons you see on the screen are the ones who are quite active these days. Architect Christian Murray and Dr. Monica Grosso have been part of the team since the beginning. Uh, and uh, well, Chris joined the team in 2004. Dr. Guillermo Gutierrez is the one I mentioned who lives in Puerto Madryn, in Patagonia. Julieta Freire is a young archaeologist who, who's got a, a master's degree from Cadiz and who Hakan knows well because she, she did an internship. She spent some time in Turkey. And in fact, I think this photo is from there. There's a conservator, conservator Marian Pousa. She lives in Ushuaia, in Tierra del Fuego, and she can only join our projects uh, periodically or intermittently, but it's good to have her. She's fantastic. Uriel Sokolovic is in charge of film production, uh, like all the TV programs and the, and the films that uh, were done regarding our projects. And Daniela de Oz is, um, is interested in studying early sites, uh, let's say prehistoric submerged sites. So it's, it's fantastic to see also young people in the team that uh, will hopefully, or I would say surely, continue to develop UCH in my country. With that, I conclude. So thank you very, very much for your attention. Muchas gracias. There's my email address if you want to write to me. And of course, I am uh, I'm open to answer any questions if you if you have any thank you very much for this amazing presentation uh, Loli it was very nice uh, and really one day I really want to come there with the horse riding to see this beautiful region I thought you were going to say diving no of course, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah diving too of course Uh, if there is a question, they can. I'm answer. looking. Uh, all I'm saying is congratulations, Lovie, for you know great presentation. Uh, I don't see any any questions. I certainly I noted Hakan's request to come and join the horse riding. Um, I'll, I'll if you do, and that would be wonderful if you could. I'm going to ask you: Did you enjoy three and a half days on a horse? Um, that tends to <laughs> sort out people. Um, 
Oh, Mark Andre has asked a question. What was the impact on your team from COVID? Thank you, Mark Andre. Nice to nice to see you here. Well, I think uh, the impact on our team was like uh, probably for all, if not most of us, the frustration of not being able to do any field work. I think we all realized how important it is a field work component. We took advantage of of the lockdown and COVID for writing and teaching online and all of that. And we're all exhausted of having done that intensively, but uh, we miss we miss going to the field, we miss diving. Um, and in some people in our team, the impact was higher because they, uh, well, I, I'll include myself. We had relatives with COVID, hospitalized, um, some some people got a bit low uh, for all the situation and the uncertainty. By the way, many of us cannot yet travel to Europe or to the US, for example, because of the vaccines that we have, mostly the Sputnik, the Russian vaccine is the one that was applied in Argentina and other Latin American countries. So we feel a bit trapped, but um, I would say that's that's the main thing I can think of. Those are the main things I can think of. And I noticed there were other other questions. In yeah, I've got another question, Molly. Um, it's from Hans van Tilburg to everyone. What were the obstacles to diving on the potential cannon site? And then later he says, was it a lack of compressed air, too deep for breath hold? Um, Thank you, Hans. No, it's actually very shallow because uh, the original vessel, the Purisima Concepcion, stranded. So even with high tide, and there is a considerable tidal range there, probably about five, six meters between high and low tide. Uh, as I was saying, even with high tide, the place is shallow, but it is the open ocean. And it is, um, I think, the combination of two things, the, the hydrometeorological conditions that were not favorable. Uh, we wanted to be very cautious because of the place where we were. Um, there was, I mean, the evacuation would have been extremely complicated in case of a problem. So we didn't want to risk anything unless we, we felt uh, we were covering the safety components enough. We didn't have much time because we were working on land. Like I showed you, there was a land excavation, there was an intertidal search, there was a diving component. And I think now with hindsight that that was a mistake. Next time, I think it would be better to just do the underwater uh, work and concentrate on that and not have to think of the horses, the food, the tent, the, the cylinders, the boat, it's uh, just just too much happening at the same time. Um, so we hope to to go back, but it was basically that. Lolly, there's another question from Diego Carabias from Chile. Which are the main difficulties you face in Argentina in order to create and maintain a competent research research team in maritime underwater or maritime oblique underwater archaeology? Can you say again, please? So, Diego, which are the main difficulties you face in Argentina in order to create and maintain a competent research team in maritime stroke underwater archaeology? Well, I may ask Diego to be more specific because I would say that we do have a team that is maintained. Now, whether we're competent or not, it's not for me to say, but I think we do have a team. I think our Achilles heel is uh, the lack of a permanent conservator in the team. Because like I said, per people like Marian Posa, which, who is an excellent conservator, she can, she's not part of our team really. She joins uh, specific projects whenever she can and whenever there's money from some organization to pay her. And another obstacle is uh, the fact that Let's say the senior people in the team, Christian, myself, um, I mean, I'm talking about people with, 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 uh, who are paid for the job, no? Uh, 
because Chris is an honorary researcher, but Christian, myself, and to a lesser extent, Monica, will retire in the not too distant future. And unless the next generation gets uh, can get a job and stay, it will be really difficult to continue that. For now, Guillermo and Julieta, they both got, uh, Julieta has a doctoral grant for five years. She got it, this is the first year, so she has four more years to go. And Guillermo has got a tenure, uh, tenure track position in Conicet. So at least those two have a job, but um, the others, I don't know. For example, Daniela, the one I mentioned who is interested in, in doing prehistoric submerged archeology, span she doesn't have a grant, she doesn't have a job, she doesn't have a scholarship, and she's thinking of, of emigrating, of leaving the country. That's another problem. Some people finish the career here and then and they want to go overseas, either because the salaries are too low or because the social environment is too distressful or whatever. So that is a challenge. But maybe you want to specify more, Dio. Uh, I can't see whether Diego has responded. I guess you've fully answered his questions. Uh, Hans has recognised the difficulties of trying to work on the terrestrial and the and the very shallow offshore environment kind of simultaneously. And uh, I think we've all faced similar problems with different different sites. Anyone else w wish to make a, a comment or ask a question of, of Lolly? It would appear not. Um, oh, yes, no, Diego has just confirmed the answer was very, very clear. And thank you, Lolly. Uh, thanks, Lolly. Um, I think I, I, as the sort of estraniero, the, the foreigner in the team, and having had some experience in, let's say, the United Kingdom and, and perhaps elsewhere, I'd like to congratulate Lolly and the team for not just staying as we, as we, uh, as the team could have done working on the SWIFT, but also expanding their areas of interest into management, recognizing the problem with conservation and different modes, different modalities of transport. Um, we don't ever know whether we're going to be diving, horseback, quad bike, or some other form, even helicopter from time to time. So I think the team has done a fantastic job in expanding its interest into, um, and particularly with the development of, uh, of Danny, Danny's interest in paleo landscape archaeology, which is, is growing and growing, and the links with Flinders and other institutions overseas. So the network has grown dramatically, and I think a lot of that is down to, to Lolly's direction. One might say that you're a bit biased, <laughs> but thank you anyway. <laughs> yeah, that may be so. I am a bit biased, but I try to be objective. And I know people who have been and worked with you from outside would say exactly the same as I just done. So, Hakan, have you got any closing remarks? Yeah, actually, not as um, closing remarks, but I just want to remind everyone that if uh, some of you couldn't come uh, and listen to all the presentation, uh, all the other presentations, and also this one is recording and uh, you can uh, watch them from YouTube, um, iCoach account. Thank you very much and have a great day. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you, Hakan. And uh, just to finish, Mark andre chipped in by saying great leadership internationally as well. So, and um, okay, I think on that note, um, we can close the seminar, the webinar, and look forward to seeing everybody in a month's time. Thank you, Hakan. Thank and thank you, you everybody for coming. Thank you for coming and listening. Bye.